this button right here, everybody else can hear it around the world, okay? I'm really not speaking to you guys today. I'm, I never do. I speak to those people, okay? They're the ones that are calling me and sending me emails, okay? So I'm going to deal with them, and you guys will have to just listen and get what you can get, okay? <laughs> That's the way it is. You've been here too long for that. Uh, let's see. The object of faith, we, we looked at last time. Now, today we're going to talk about the content of faith. And uh, what is the date today? Anybody know? 29? 9, 29, 19? Okay, so the person that's going to make a recording of that will know. Okay? Well, <laughs> if, if I put it on there, yeah. <laughs> we don't worry too much about it, but in a sequence of a, a sermon series, it's nice to have everything in order, but it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's still available, but... Anyway, uh, we're going to fix all that here real soon. The, uh, the content of faith, it obviously begins with your faith in Christ. Okay, But I want you to understand something about faith, and this is very important. And I'm going to focus on this today a little bit, and we might go into this next week. I'm not going to put any limits on how long we have to talk about this one, because this one is an issue with you as a soldier of Jesus Christ in the field trying to get people saved. You know the controversy of James 2 and Romans 4 with Martin Luther. He tore it out, rolled it up, was going to light his stove with it. He, he had to get rid of James chapter 2. Well, he had to get rid of all of James. But if he had just went back to chapter 1, he could have seen that the people that James was writing to, they had already gotten saved. They were begotten of God. Okay? They were already saved people. So when you talk about the issue of faith, you have to break it up a little bit into parts. So you've got people that are trying to learn how to believe something by faith, by grace, right, through faith. Some people quote that backwards, but it's by grace, God brings it to you by grace, and then you by faith believe it. So Sandy's got the perfect shirt on back there. It's great. It's, it's something that people look at and they they think faith is some blind following of something no 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 faith has to be in something very specific and if you mess that up you're going to believe that works or for your salvation i had this young girl here oh she she's not very old i don't think but i didn't ask her her age but she uh she sent me a response and was looking at us on facebook and she sent me a private message, and we had a little conversation. And then uh, I didn't get any response from her until I got back from Nashville. And then I, I saw it, and I said, oh, she gave me a response. And her response was exactly what she had been talking about before, and it was incorrect. And I'm pretty tired. I've been driving for eight hours, seven hours or so. And I got home, and I, you know, I walked in. I said, everything's here. Nothing's broke. The AC works. We're good. So I turned the computer on. <laughs> I turned my computer all on, and I had unplugged everything because I didn't want to get hit by lightning. And I plugged it all back in. And I start talking to this girl on the private message, and I, she sent me a message that long, and then I sent her one about this long because she was confused. She was very confused. And see, people try, and I say this, they only try this because they're, they're, really under the influence of the satanic policy of evil. They've been taught something that's wrong, which is a lie. Satan doesn't have to come to your door and knock on it to do that. He can just put it out into the world and you suck it up. Okay? And so when you do that, you can start thinking that faith isn't what it really is. What a beautiful thing to do to create turmoil and confusion. Faith is something do, to do. And no, oh no, faith is not something to do. Well, when you go back to chapter 2 of James, it's very interesting why so many people can't figure that chapter out. But I have the experience of going through the same process. I couldn't figure it out either until I began to study it from a different viewpoint. And then I realized, oh, that's simple. The Jews require a sign. God requires obedience. 
So the only way that a Jew can talk to another Jew and learn that he's actually saved is he wants to see it. Prove it. Show me. Like Missouri. The show me state, right? Show me. And people think, well, you show me and I'll believe it. And God says, no, you believe it and then I'm going to show you. So if you go that route and you understand that, What's going to happen is you're going to have no problem with faith in the Bible whatsoever. And I know people at the very, very apex of this movement that still don't get this. And they've been preaching for 30, 40 years, okay? So James chapter 2 is not off limits. You should learn James chapter 2 above all else. And when we get to James chapter 2, which I'm going to preach on and teach on for a while, I want you to understand that the way they proved that they were faithful is they were faithful in obedience, and they did what God said. So, okay, now I know you're genuine. When the Pharisees and Sadducees came to John the Baptist when he was baptizing Christ, what did he tell them? You're a bunch of liars. Go home. I know who you are. I know what you do. He was a priest. His father was a priest. And so <clears throat> what happens is <laughs> they, he pronounces judgment on them right there. And then when he meets the Savior, when he meets his Savior, his cousin, by the way, when he meets the Lord Jesus Christ there where the stones were piled up, where Joshua brought them across the Jordan River, the Jordan River parted, you know. And uh, I'm thinking while it was up, they put the stones out there if they were smart. <laughs> but they come across right there, okay? And he gets on those guys because they want to be children of the kingdom. They want to be children. They want to act like it. They just want to come and find out what's going on. And he says, you guys are useless. He said he could take those stones out there in the middle of that brook and make believers. You can't do it because you refuse to believe. They're obstinate. They're apostate. And the number one person at the top of that apex three and a half to four and a half years later was Saul of Tarsus. He's as low as you can get. And yet he got saved, didn't he? So when you understand how long it took him <clears throat> to get saved, it's amazing. Because when you're talking to Jesus with the sky open <laughs> and he's talking directly to you and he says something to you like, why persecutest thou me? Yeah, it's, it's hard. We say you're going to bang your head against the wall. Like the guy who kept banging his head against the wall, and the guy came up and asked him, why are you doing that? Because it feels so good when I stop. You know, <laughs> the logic had gotten to him from banging his head on the wall, but <clears throat> maybe not. You know, you, you think about it, and he says, who art thou? Can you imagine asking not an apparition or a ghost or anything like that. We're talking about the heavens open. The Lord Jesus Christ knocks him off his horse and says, Saul, Saul. And when somebody says your name twice, you better listen, especially with God, okay? Why persecutest thou me? He doesn't say them. He says me. You're dealing with me. But there was a relationship with him from the time he was in his mother's womb, and Saul didn't know anything about that relationship. But when you see a woman with a baby in her, and you go ahead into the future and see whether he'll believe this or not, what's going to happen? Foreknowledge pays off, doesn't it? He's not looking for somebody that will take this job. He already knows he's going to take the job. And he, Paul says it in Galatians chapter 1. He called me, he says, by, from my mother's womb. And so, <clears throat> just like Jeremiah was. See, God knows the end from the beginning. And that's where you and I have to quit thinking and just start believing, because you can't figure that out. Brilliant chess play. Oh, unbelievable, yeah. I mean, you know, it's just crazy. So when you think about it, you say, well, okay, so do we have to prove we're saved today? If somebody meets somebody and they don't know each other and they're talking about testimony and so forth, what happens when a person starts talking to another person and you're talking about whether they're saved or not? There's a conversation going on about salvation, right? That's what Christ was doing with Saul. 
And when, when he heard those words, he says, who art thou? Yeah, question mark. Lord, is that you? And I, I, I think it would have been funny if he said, who do you think it is? <laughs> who else? <laughs> it's silly. Oh, of course he knew exactly who it was, but he was timid about it because he really didn't know, which proves he didn't know, which is really good because now you've got a baseline to judge the man. Did he know? I have people told me over the years that, that Saul got saved under the kingdom program. No. Well, no, the dispensation of grace had to have already started because Saul had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. He was, he was a bad guy, and all his cronies had done it. So the only way, and I've told you this before, he, he wraps them in the dispensation of grace. He starts it, and I, I believe it was already going. It had to be. We don't really have a, a clear timeline on, on the time, from the time Stephen was stoned until he got saved on the road to Damascus. But he had run everybody out of Jerusalem, and in Damascus there were a lot of them there, and that's where they were headed. So he went there. To get them. And he persecuted them under, under strange cities. And so when you start looking at this, you, you have to start watching Saul from the time he gets saved until he gets to Ananias and he goes through all this process. And Ananias says, Arise, why tarriest thou? Well, I'm tarrying because I'm blind. I haven't eaten. I haven't drank. I just saw something that changed my life. Why are you tarrying? This is a guy that didn't even want him in his house, okay? So he says, why tarriest thou, thou arise and be what? Baptized. Now, did he do it or not? He did. Okay, so why? Was he going to get saved again? Was he going to get saved under the kingdom program? What was it? Preparing, not for the priesthood, but preparing for service, period. But like a priest, right. Yeah. So I understand. The idea is that, that he was going to do what God always requires of his servants. Clean up before you serve me. He told Moses more than once. And he didn't say, you tell those, jinka, those, those stinking Jews to clean up. He didn't say it that way. He commanded them. That's why when the priest walks in, what's the first thing he does? He washes. And they have special clothes. They're, oh, absolutely. You don't, want a, you don't want a person looking, acting, and smelling like a pagan working in this tabernacle. Because it's a holy place. And God has never, never, ever been unclean. Unclean in the Bible is the opposite of the way you should be. Right? When you're unclean, you're not saved. Or in your program, you're, you're out of God's program in the sense of, look, you clean yourself up. And these washings, these baptisms in the Old Testament were, were able to refer to washing your dishes and washing your body, washing the vessels of the, of the tabernacle, all that. So when you see the word baptize, it's not always the same. So he gets up and he gets baptized. Right? But for service. And it's, it's fascinating to see why people or how people get messed up on the thinking about what faith is. Did he do it by faith? He did not question Ananias. From that time on, he's a, he's a different man. And when more people started to hear about it, <clears throat> mostly from... Uh, the kingdom saints, uh, and when Barnabas was out seeking him, he, he's telling everybody he meets about Saul, what's happened to Saul. They all knew who Saul was. They're the ones that had been running from him. Right. He's public enemy number one as far as they're concerned. And when he finally convinced a lot of them that, that Saul had gotten saved, it says, then all the churches had rest. Now, these weren't, king, these weren't uh, grace churches. These were kingdom churches. These are churches, these are synagogues that are out in the, in the wilderness areas 
of the Gentile territories that were started by people who did not go back under Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah and rebuild the temple after Babylon. In other words, the Jews got carried down to Babylon and they never came back. Just a few of them came back. And the rest of them dispersed. And they just stayed where they were and they started making a living and they did all this stuff. And so they had synagogues. And between Malachi and Matthew, that little 400 year period, that's when the local synagogue became very popular. And the local synagogue was necessary because they didn't have a temple. As a matter of fact, there was no temple at Jerusalem until Herod started to build one. So the one that was knocked down by Nebuchadnezzar stayed knocked down. That was Solomon's temple. So you gotta, gotta get all this stuff of how this denominationalism began to grow even among the Hebrews and their synagogues. You find out with the Lord in, uh, when he goes back to Nazareth in his hometown synagogue and he reads in the, in the scripture there and he shows them how to rightly divide a particular sentence in Isaiah 62, what happens is he, he finds himself in a hostile environment. They want to kill him, take him out. They were going to grab him and take him and throw him over the cliff. And he got away from them and they didn't get him, right? So you see how they treated their own prodigy that grew up reading the scriptures in that little synagogue? When he sat down and said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears, they said, heretic. And that's what they thought he was. They guarded that little synagogue with their lives, but not with the scriptures, evidently. That's what I'm sorry to share with the family. Yeah, it's true. That, you know, a prophet is not heard in his own country, is he? I mean, he, he goes back home and they don't, they don't believe him. So it's just one of those things. So the content of faith for you and me begins with our faith in Christ to believe that he died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and now we understand by faith, see, by, by God's grace bringing it to us, by faith we now know the content of what it is we have to believe. We do not have to believe the things Abraham believed, Moses believed, David, David believed. We have to believe this and what what the little flock knew about that did not exist because nobody had ever explained it to them yet. Who explained the cross to the little flock? Paul. When God cut everybody off and went to a single tube to one man, one shoot, one tube, one access line, whatever you want to call it, when he began to be exclusively to Paul, everybody had to get it from Paul. And there were lots of times, like you go into Acts 10, with Cornelius, and, and you start looking at that situation, you realize, well, Saul's already been saved, and he's out there doing his thing now. And what does Peter say? Can anybody here, can any man here forbid water? They didn't understand. They're speaking in tongues, right? They got the clear gifts of the Holy Spirit, but in Acts chapter 2, you had to believe and be what? You had to repent and you had to be water baptized. Now the water baptism can't save anybody because the blood of bulls and goats can't save anybody. So you know water can't save anybody. It's never saved anybody anytime. What did it do? It brought about a situation where when they would repent, which is the first word used, change your mind, and then wash yourself unto service. Baptism unto repentance. Does it produce it? Yeah. And what, was, what must we do, they said to him. He says, repent, change your mind, quit thinking like you're thinking now, quit thinking like the synagogue thinks, quit thinking like the temple guys think, start thinking like I am speaking to you in this whole thing, and I'm proving it with signs, miracles, and wonders. It's at hand, and that's what the whole, that started the whole thing. But this is three and a half years later, and all these people had come from out of town from the dispersion countries, and they had showed up, and they were, they were supposed to do it at Jerusalem. And so when they got there, what happened? 
They didn't know what was going on. What's the big hullabaloo? Well, uh, guess in case you didn't know, you know, about a week ago, we killed God on a cross. Oh, wow. <laughs> so what happens is he gets the representatives of all the Jews around the world back at Jerusalem. And then Peter speaks to them in his own language, and they hear it in their own foreign language because none of them know Hebrew. I mean, they don't have to. Just because they're Jewish doesn't mean they learned Hebrew. Some of them might have spoken you know, Chaldean. Some of them might have been sp uh, speaking you know, more Greek. Who knows what they were speaking? But if you look at Acts chapter 2, you see the listings of where they all are from, and it shows you that these are foreigners, but they're still Jews. So the miracle here is, kind of like at the United Nations, when they sit there and speak into the microphone, it goes through translators and then goes into the ears of these people who have no clue about English. I can't understand in this day and age why they would ever send a representative to the United Nations that couldn't speak English, but that's, that's just the way it is. So they do that to make it clear, right? But that's done mechanically. This one, it came out of his mouth and it was changed in their ears. Now that's not the same kind of speaking in tongues that you hear about in 1 Corinthians. That's different. 1 Corinthians is a different reason to use tongues. If I ask you today what you think tongues are, what would you say? Different Just different languages. That's all it is. It's not, any, it's not code for something spooky or weird or supernatural. It just means, and Paul says, when I, he says, I spoke in tongues more than you all. He had to because he was in all these different countries talking. Paul could have spent six months trying to learn their language before he ever gave them the gospel. We don't know. Absolutely. Well, he was well educated in those languages, see. And so what happens is when you see this go on, you realize, too, that there weren't as many languages in the Middle East as you think. But when you start going into Africa and when you start going into other areas, it's going to really be difficult, right? So he says, I spoke in tongues more than you all. Well, this whole issue of speaking in tongues on the day of Pentecost, what it did is it was a proof that he was speaking for God. Would you say that? Okay, there's no doubt. He preaches to them on the day of Pentecost, and a few days later, he's preaching to them in Acts chapter 3, and they had a whole year laid out for them, go preach it and preach it as hard as you can. And what happened? They got beat up, they got whipped, they got thrown in jail, they got, I mean, it was, it was insensitive to, to even think that those people were not being persecuted. And what were they doing? They were singing about it. And you see that happening with Barnabas and uh, Paul and Silas, and all of them, different people doing that. And, and so it's all a kind of a, a way for you to comprehend when you talk to people that you do not have to prove to me that you're saved. I want to hear your testimony, and that will be the proof to me. We're just going to cut it right down to the quick. We're not going to see if you're doing good works at the hospital or you're doing good works in your church or whatever. I'm, I don't have time to go around and follow you and watch you do that. And even if you're doing it, you might not be doing it genuinely. Anyway, so here's what I, want to, here's what I really want to hear. I want to hear how that works to give you eternal life right where you stand right now. So in our case, <clears throat> the content of faith is what we've already talked about. The blood, faith alone, Romans chapter 4, and the object of faith in chapter 4 is always God. Always. Give a track years ago when I was standing. Yeah. You're talking about uh, Romans 1, 17, faith to faith. Yeah. Where one faith is objective, the other one is right. subjective. Right. Faith to faith has to do yeah yeah well the just shall live by faith that verse doesn't say the just get saved by faith it says they live by their faith which is exactly what the Jews require you to do so that you can keep showing us that you're saved or that you're a true believer in God see the whole issue was the believing was not about the cross back in the old days. It was about the very first thing that God, how he reveals himself is he is the creator of heaven and earth. 
That goes on for 2,500 years, okay? And then under the law, it starts to be expressed more, more, uh, with more elaboration and, and more understanding. He's not just the creator of heaven and earth. He's now the person who has started a new family with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when those people come out of, of uh, Egypt, they're part of a family, you see. And there are millions of them. If you look at the number of them that came out, that was just the men. So if you take just the men and add the wives and some children, you've got a massive, massive exodus of people. And you can see why Pharaoh didn't want all that free labor to leave, right? Then he changed his mind and chased them, and then he drowned, okay? So you get what you get. But God says, I got a job for you, Moses. Bring them out. So the people that wanted to stay, they could stay. But if they did not put that blood over the lintel of that door, you know what happened to them? Their firstborn would die that night by the death angel. It was going to happen to Pharaoh's firstborn. It did. It could have happened to Moses, but he was warned on the way down there to circumcise his oldest boy or he's going to die in Egypt because he's not going to be exempt. Well, what was going to keep him from dying? What puts him under the protection of the covenant? Circumcision. So as soon as he stops and God's talking to him about it, his wife comes up with a knife and says, do it right now. And so you have this understanding that Jewish life with the Hebrews was, it wasn't started yet. They weren't Jews yet. They had no religion yet. You see, they were just Hebrews, Hebrew slaves. But they did have a common ancestry with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that was where the religion part of it started. And that only lasted about 1,500 years. So you have to remember that that there is a way of thinking, and it does progress. So when you're thinking about the gospel, think about the, the content of what needs to be believed, the content of faith. It may be based upon the context or a, a particular message. If you're reading the Bible, it would be the context. That's how you figure that out. The message, it, it might be a particular message at a particular time or in a particular dispensation, right? And it may be for a plan or a purpose to be obeyed. So when God gives Abraham instructions, that's a specific plan. Go do this. If you understand it's in a particular time, we know it's in time past, it's back here, right? There it is. And so then you begin to understand that, okay, so he talks to different people in different ways, at different times, and that doesn't necessarily mean he's talking to me today. Yes, exactly. It's none of your business, okay, until you learn what you're supposed to learn over here so that you can actually spiritually grasp some of this. You have to get saved and get the Holy Spirit in you. So what do you start with? Romans 1 to 3. It's superstition. It's, well, they were full of that, okay? Even the Jews, he kept, the whole thing was a constant battle, okay? Most of the Jews that came out of Egypt <clears throat> did not fare very well, okay? They weren't really Jews yet, but they were trying to be. But what happened to them? They didn't want to obey God. He says, okay, I got something for you to do. You ever had the coach say, hey, I told you not to do that. Ten laps. Ten laps around the track's pretty hard, especially while everybody else is over playing kickball, football, whatever, and you're running around the track. And every time you run around, we say, <laughs> you're in trouble, you know? What's he do? He walks them around in the wilderness for 40 years until they all drop dead, and only a few of them were the originals from Egypt, okay? Now, I don't mean they had a small group. I'm saying there was quite a few left. But they were all born during that time, and they were not sassing and talking back and saying, oh, we can't do that. We don't have any quail to eat. We need meat. Okay, we don't like this. And they're walking around in a circle. There's a mountain here, a mountain here, a mountain. They walk from mountain to mountain to mountain and to, to the various places where they could get water and so forth. 
And even Moses got a little cocky about it. And he hit the rock, and the water came out. Ooh, big deal. And then he did it again in anger. And you know what happened? No promised land for you, pal. So you've got to understand how strict the law is. The law is not designed to make you a better person. It's not. It's not designed to make you a better theologian. It's to walk around behind you with this little finger going guilty, 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 guilty. And it's just all the time. Now, how do you get rid of that? You sing the song. My guilt is all gone. You know the song, right? There's power in the blood. All those songs we sing, my guilt is all gone. If it's gone, then quit thinking like you're guilty of something. You know you're guilty of doing things. Your conscience can do that for you. However, when you're trying to understand the content of the faith, you need to do it in context. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. I I, I just cannot get through all of this in one message, so we're going to stretch it out until we get it right. Uh, All of it. Galatians chapter 3. In verse 8. Look at verse 6 with me. Abraham believed God. Look at verse 6. 3, 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it, his believing, was accounted to him for righteousness. Case closed. One time. One place. One Savior. That's it. He doesn't do it for you all the time until... You're right up to your death, and then he does the last little sin you just thought, then now you can get in. That is how Catholics think. Last rites, okay? Forget it. it I know, but the, the thing is, you've got to understand that when you get saved and put into the body of Christ, you have every bit of what Christ now has coming to him, and already has it, you have it all yourself. Wow. Wow. That's a big lotto win, isn't it? But it's not a chance. It's by faith. You don't try all the religions and try to figure out which is the best one, or I'm going to be a Jew, a Catholic, and all this other stuff, so I can cover my bases. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I'm going to cover all my bases. You cover all your bases, and you're going to get burnt to a crisp, okay? Because God does not want you to choose everything else, okay? It's door number one, number two, or number three. Which one is it? <laughs> You've got to make the choice. And so Abraham made it, but it took him a while to make it. And then once he got to that point, we begin to see Abraham's faith evolve, and he goes from being a person who didn't believe God to a person who did believe God, and he got justified right there. And then he asked him to get circumcised, and he did that with no problem. And then he he asked him to offer his only son that he had been waiting for years for. He waited 15, 16 years to get that boy after he had uh, Ishmael. So that's 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 a hard thing to do, to let God not talk to you for 15 years because you did something stupid. But at the same time, he, he endured it. Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now, if you take that the wrong way and you find people trying to tell you that that, that means we're spiritual Israel and that's exactly what they're going to do. Acts 28 people believe that. They said, oh, you know, okay, so we're spiritual. No, 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 no. We are not a spiritual Israel in any way, shape, or form. We are B-O-C, body of Christ. But we are in type, in a representation, in a specific way, we are now what? We're operating under the same thinking that Abraham did. That's all he's asking us to do. Why do you think Paul quotes Habakkuk 2.4 in the first chapter of Romans? The just shall live by faith. It doesn't say that in Habakkuk 2.4. It says the just man shall live by his faith. Hello? If you read that, you say, well, why did God change it in chapter 1? Because God is updating it so you can get it. Because if a man lives by his faith, like they did back there when they believed, then you're going to end up doing the same thing. 
So then he's going to tell you later how you get that. Okay. So ju the just shall live by faith. Paul uses it three times. When you, when you look at it, you see that now it takes on a wider meaning. What's the, what's the wider meaning? Not living my little life of 50, 60 years. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about eternal life. The context in Romans 1 is telling you about eternal life. And if you'll notice, he talks about it before he gets into the judgments against the Gentiles. See, it's, if you look at that thing closely, go back, just go back to Romans 1 real quick and we'll show you that this is really important. He gives you a sugar cube right before you get the bitter stuff because the bitter stuff is sometimes misunderstood when you read these 43 counts of sin against the human race. You start thinking about that and you go, gee, that's where I am. No, not now. If you're saved, you're not there anymore. None of that can be put against you. You don't have to worry about what sin is, what sin does. What the, none of that. You can learn it. And you should apply it, but once you're saved, you have no idea what's even happened to you for probably at least a year. Unless somebody's teaching you well, okay. I've had people come in this church have been saved for 25, 30 years and had no clue what, this was, what was going on in Romans through Philemon. I've been thinking about printing Romans through Philemon in a book by itself and explaining this particular issue and not even let them go to the Old Testament or the books behind it, <laughs> Paul's epistles. And, and I did that in, in uh, 92, 93. We put Paul, Paul's epistles in a concordance form. I got one in my bag. And, and Richard asked me, he goes, why would you do that? I said, because I'm not interested in these other sections of the Bible until I learn this section. Because he was not thinking the same way. He wants all of it in one place, and a big fat one. I don't, have, I don't have a way to hand that to everybody, okay? I needed to hand something to people where they could just see what Paul said about it. And every time I see a verse, I can tell you if Paul said it. And so when you, when you think like that, you start isolating all that other stuff first. Have you ever sat down at a table and want to do something that's cluttered with all kinds of junk? You just got to go clean it all off and set your table up and just get the stuff out in front of you that you can see. That's what he does here in the first chapter. Notice this. He starts out with the gospel uh, in verse 1. And so he goes down to verse 14. He says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. That means educated Greeks and non-educated Greeks, both to the wise, to the unwise. Okay. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Well, if he's writing to them, they must be saved. Well, some of them are, and some of them are not saved, and there will always be new ones to get saved. So when the epistle is sent out, it's not only sent out to save people, it's going to be talking about their ministry with lost people. Does that make any sense? Why would Paul go to Rome to preach the gospel? Because they're, they're set up with about 10 or 12 different families or 10 or 12 different locations with these little home churches, and he's trying to let them know, I'm coming to help you do this in the capital of the empire. So he goes there and he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, verse 16, for it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto what? Salvation. Just like repentance, see, water baptism, you get baptized unto repentance. So when you look at repentance and water baptism, you see, well, that's just the ritual. But the repentance is the real issue, isn't it? The changing of your mind. So he says, he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's to everyone that believeth. Doesn't matter now. There is no Jew or Greek. He says it's to the Jew or the Greek and also to the Greek. What does that mean? It means that the middle wall of partition is now falling down and there is no difference. So quit making the distinction. The Jews could never do that. That's all they were ever taught. They're different. Oh, you're different, all right. You're just gonna, but you're gonna go to the same place if you don't, if you're not careful. So lake of fire is for the devil and his angels. But who else goes there? Revelation 21:8 says all liars go there. So that includes you. Okay. Now, since you aren't charged with your lies now, do you have anything to worry about? 
you know, you got lies still in your life. You got lies ahead of you. Next week, the following week, you're going to lie and lie and lie and lie and lie and lie. Okay? Everybody does it. Believe me. Everybody does it. And in Revelation 21, 8, it says, Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Romans 3. And then in Revelation 28, all liars go to the lake of fire. So how do you reconcile that? And a lost person, how do they process that? Every time I preach in the prison, I start with those two verses. And they all look at me like my dog. Huh? Huh? You know. Yeah, that's what I just said. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. All liars go to the lake of fire. If you put those two verses together, it's pretty powerful. And it gets rid of a lot of clutter in the room real quick because they need to understand. See, it is the gospel of your salvation. He says, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. And he says, from faith to faith. The Old Testament way to believing was by faith. The new way here in the dispensation of grace is by faith. Okay? It is also based on the faith of Jesus Christ going to Calvary. And then it comes to your faith in believing that. Faith to faith. I read a book called Faith to Faith and the Seven Bible Covenants by a guy. Little thing. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. Didn't understand one bit of it. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about the covenants yet. So, seven Bible covenants. Okay, so when you start looking at the thing and you start getting back here and getting your feet down in the mud, what should you do? Get out and go back to square one and start trying to figure it out like God tells you to. Romans 1, 1. Now, he's going to tell you, I am not ashamed of this which he does. It is the power of God unto salvation. He says in verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let me ask you a question. Is God okay? Is it okay with God? <laughs> kind of presumptuous to say this, but is it okay to say something different when he gives it to Paul than he did to Habakkuk? Can he change what he said? Yeah, it's called an update. <laughs> it's like a software thing. You just plug it in and it updates your phone, everything. You get an update. Why? Because he's going to use it now in the context of saving everybody, not just people back here in the Hebrew program. He's trying to open the door wider. In Acts 10 and 11, you read them when they get done with their little meeting. It says they conclude that God... And they're talking about Peter and Cornelius, because Cornelius was a Gentile. And he says, they say, we're perceiving that God has opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Did they know what the door of faith was? Of course they did. These were saved Jews talking in this group that were grilling Peter for going and eating with a Gentile. So they finally figured it out. Acts 10. He has opened the door of faith. They didn't come up with that idea that minute. They already were well aware of what faith was. You see, faith is the only thing that works from the beginning to the end. It's always the underlying theme of everything God wants. If, Abraham, if uh, Adam had believed God when he said, don't eat of the tree, what would have happened? Let's just go down that road for two seconds. What would have happened? He would have grown into the, the person that the Lord Jesus Christ had to come and be. In other words, he would have been the prophet, priest, and king of the planet. There would have been a perfect world and a perfect kingdom. And we really don't know what would happen after that because we can't figure out the world because... We had sin come into the world. How are you going to deal with that? There wouldn't have been any. Can you conceive the idea of God just having all these people populate and just grow up and just live together with him on his own little blue marble in the middle of nowhere? That's wild, isn't it? You don't think that Adam was called that. 
He's called the first Christ. That, that's Adam. That's the first Adam. But who's the second Adam? Jesus Christ. <laughs> what does he do? He comes to do what he refused to do. You know why he said he did it? He says, you, you hearken to your wife. So how would God reclaim the heavens? Well, <laughs> when you look at how he's going to reclaim the heavens, you have to ask yourself, when did the fall take place? Well, we know it took place before Adam and Eve walked up to the serpent, right? So I have no answer to that. I've wrestled with that for a long time. There's a sequence of events, but you know what? Here's one little, little button you can push all the time, okay? Fast forward. Foreknowledge. God lives in foreknowledge. He already knows the outcome of everything, and he works backwards. Now, I don't mean backwards in a bad sense, but what I'm saying is, He's already there. He's already, it's already done in his mind. So you understand, we can't comprehend that. But his, his, his instrumentality is the nation of Israel and the body of Christ. He's got a predetermined purpose for the outcome of those two functional entities in his plan. Yeah. Through foreknowledge, uh, to then he did foreknow, then he did predestine. That predestination has to do with the functionality of the church, the body of Christ, and the instrumentality yeah. of the nation of Israel. Yeah, predestination. Just as a clarification with what you just said for the listeners, I guess I'm hearing, is it's always been by faith, and the Gentile always had access by faith through Israel right. when the instrumentality was in place functioning on the planet. Right. So it wasn't a matter of it's now when that, when that middle wall of partition was broken down it wasn't saying, now the Gentiles can get saved. It goes back to here before, 2,500 years before the law. They all had access to it. Exactly. There was no problem. Abraham was not a Jew. Correct. He was a Chaldean worshiper of idols. So when you see that first 2,500 years, you go, what were they doing back there? They had been given up at the Tower of Babel because they were trying to reach heaven the wrong way. You don't build a tower to get to heaven. What do we do? We build a tower, go over to Cape Canaveral and see the thing. You get up inside of it, shoo, they shoot you out there. And oh my goodness, woo-hoo, here we are. There's nothing out here. Duh. <laughs> I mean, you know, I went and saw. What you can do is you can believe God. Well, they don't want to believe God. I mean, progressive revelation of what they was available to believe. But man's so, man's Sin nature won't allow him to believe God. And the first way it was manifested was he listened to his wife. He took the fruit and ate it. He could have took it and threw it on the ground, grabbed her hand and took her to God and said, fix this. Right. Hello? But he didn't. He took it and he ate it. And you can't change that. Because, see, the world population isn't in Eve. It's in Adam. And in Adam, all die. And so he's dealing now from the very beginning with the dying race. And he actually came here and had to participate in that because it was the only way that it could be done legally. And God the Father isn't going to do anything illegal. And so his son says, I'll do it. You see how they work together? This is a lot smoother when you're reading the Pauline epistles. It's going to be a lot smoother the minute you get your new body. And then when you get put into your new heavenly job, which is going to be a governmental job, you will not be like Washington or Parliament or anybody else. You're going to find yourself ruling and reigning as co-regents with the king of the universe. And that is something hard. That's hard for people to grasp. Because when you go that far out in it, they go, oh, I never thought of any of that. It's because you've got people telling you to stay in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for Christianity, and that doesn't work because it's not Christianity. Jesus Christ was not a Christian. He was a Jew. <laughs> and so it has to be learned. Okay, well, we've got to stop. Next week we're going to continue on because there's a lot more to this. Okay, and th this issue with Abraham, we're going to explore that a little bit more, and we're going to talk about that, and we're going to show you 
mechanically what Abraham actually believed when it says that, that, that he believed the gospel, what his gospel was. I <laughs> get it in. Go, go to Galatians 3. <clears throat> Galatians 3. It is. Look at 3.8. He says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, when he says this, that we are in like manner the children of Abraham, right? In verse 8, and he says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. There were no scriptures in Abraham's day. <laughs> but were they in God's mind? Was the book of Galatians written at the time he, he, this all happens to Abraham? I guarantee you there are walls up there so big with these verses all written on them from Genesis to Revelation. And they're written in solid granite, okay? Those words are there for everybody to understand and learn. However, they're not always revealed. Okay? So what does God do to protect this whole thing? Oh, it, well, he is the word of God. That's the whole thing. And so you've got to get that down next. But the, the idea is that, that he says the scriptures and the scripture foreseeing See, the scripture doesn't have to be written down yet to be scripture. All scripture is given. So if it's given for you to write down, you better write it down, okay? If I found somebody that had the book of Romans and I didn't have it, I'd write it down, okay? So when you see that the scriptures were just there waiting to be delivered to the right person at the right time, it still doesn't change what's going to be said because God has already said all of this before he ever did any of this other stuff. This is a plan. This is a book of plan. And the planning here happens to be interesting in the way that, that with our program, he didn't tell anybody about it. And if Satan didn't learn about it, which he's quite capable of doing if, if he wants to, he can't read God's mind, he can't even read your mind, but, but he knows how to get information. And it's, the Bible says that nothing can be hid from him. So if it's out there, you know, floating around, he's going to get it, all right? He's, under, he's got a lot of other ones under control. He's a creature without faith. Yeah, well, he's a creature that's got a lot of people help, or a lot of creatures helping him is what it is. That's why he needed those people for that rebellion. So when you see this, you see that he would justify the heathen through faith. It's by grace, and it's through faith and he says, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. What gospel? I had a Baptist guy argue with me. That's the, that's the cross. That's the cross. That's the cross. There is no hint of the cross because the scriptures weren't even written when he was talking to Abraham. And so what he, what he says is, he preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Meaning, we're blessed by getting the same benefits from God that Abraham got. That's all it is. That's it. Just believe God. And he says, for as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. That's why you can't get saved by it. It's cursed. And he says, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you could do that, he'd have to save you. But you can't. Romans 2 clears that up. He says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, he says, for the just shall live by faith. Oop, there it is, popped up again. Okay? He says, and the law is not of faith. Now, what does that mean? I mean, you don't have to believe it? Well, you better believe it, but you better act on it, too, if you're going to keep from being exposed to failure. And you think that's a hard line to walk? When you're trying to walk that line, and all of a sudden you're going like that, and you, you, you go and you trip and you say something you shouldn't or you do something you shouldn't, and here's that little finger going, you bony little boy, you, know, you just messed up. And so the law isn't a faith. It must be done. Okay, it's, a not, it's not a negotiable thing. All that thou hast said, we will do, they said. <laughs> 
good luck. He says, the man that doeth them shall what? Live in them. So the law is not designed to save your soul. It's designed to prove that you need a savior. That's all it is. It's the knowledge of sin. Okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer. We'll stop. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel and the, the many aspects of it. We thank you, Lord, that faith is something that needs to be in, explained to people sometimes. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you gave us the, the books to do that with. We thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.